Good morning, Christ Community Church. Will you guys stand to your feet this morning? I want to welcome you here to church today. Today, guys, we're gathered together to celebrate the greatest event in the history of the world. Three days after the death of Jesus, the stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. Christ was not there. He has risen from the dead. Amen. And because of that, because of that, we come together this morning to remember what Christ completed. We remember that Jesus made a way where there was no way. And we remember and celebrate that Jesus is alive. So guys, we're going to start today up by giving him 10 seconds of praise. Will you put your hands together? Give him a hand clap, a hoot and holler. Thank you, Jesus. Hell, that's another one. 
son to die on a cross for a sinner like me. We thank you, God, that you gave the ultimate sacrifice. And so, Lord, this morning, we pray that we can worship you, that the floodgates of heaven would open and that we would be able to lift you high because you are so worthy. You are so worthy of our praise. Amen. exaltation and I was born to lift your name above all names you hear the melody of all creation but there's a song of praise that only I can bring who else is worthy who else is worthy
Good and perfect. 
what I see glory, yes I run inside your throne room Before you I bow The veil is coming The doors flee is here. Jesus is in this room. Can you feel his presence? During worship, I was asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, what do you want me to say? And I feel like he told me, he said, there's at least one person in this building who on the outward, they look good. Their appearance is nice. They may even have new clothes on today, but in the inside, they feel broken. They're hurting. And it has taken them everything to walk through those doors, to try to put on a happy face. And they're looking around the room and they're seeing people raising their hands and they're seeing people worshiping the risen Savior. And they're feeling a void in their lives. Well, to you, there's healing available. As I said earlier, the King is here. His presence is here. And he rose again. He did that so that he can have a relationship with you. So if that's you, I pray that you let the Holy Spirit minister to you throughout this service. At the end of the service, we'll have prayer teams. But I believe today can be a new beginning for you if you will only allow it and receive it. Everybody else, if, you, if you're new here or anybody here today, I just want to say welcome to Christ Community Church. And if this is your first time, I hope when you walk through those doors that you felt like family, because that's what we are. We are one big family here. And right now at this time in our service, I want you just to find a couple people, give them a high five and tell them he is alive.
is your first time visiting us, either in person or online, we would love to get to know you. There are two options. You can fill out the online connect card in the connect tab on the app, or scan the QR code on the back of any seat or on the screen. If you are here with us, you can give in any of the offering boxes located throughout the campus. And no matter where you are, you can always give online or through our mobile app. Good morning, good morning. Happy Easter, everyone. Woo! Hello to everyone watching on our live stream. Welcome, welcome. If you're watching online, this is your first time joining in. Um, hopefully there's a QR code on your screen. So if you go to that, you can uh, scan that code. It'll take you to our first time uh, guest welcome page. Uh, otherwise, just go on our website. You can find more about us there. For everyone else here in this room, why don't you say something after I say something? I'm going to say he is risen, and then you're going to say he is risen indeed. You ready? He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right. Amen. If you're joining in online, why don't you go ahead and type that in the comments. He is risen. I've got one. Good job. Oh, man. <laughs> On the spot. I have one announcement to make. And that's our discipleship class coming up uh, next Sunday. So we offer a discipleship class uh, here at Christ Community called Foundations. And that's divided up into a series of three classes, Foundations 101, 201, and 301. So this course is designed to bring you into discipleship and community here at CCC. It'll help you understand who we are, what we believe, why we're here, where we're going, our mission, all of that. Um, so, I mean, basically, it's about finding freedom, it's about finding healing, it's about finding purpose in your life, it's about finding opportunities to, to know and to love and to serve, it's about finding your part in God's story, figuring out why you're here and fulfilling his call in your life. Um, and it's not just about learning how to be a Christian, it's about learning how to impact God's kingdom together. So we would love for you guys to join us for this first class, Foundations 101. That's this next Sunday, April 7th, in the Fellowship Hall right there at 11 a.m. Uh, child care is provided. You can drop off your kids in the kids' wing around 1045 and then head straight over to the Fellowship Hall. You can register for Foundations uh, on our church app, on our website, or online, um, I think I already said that, or in the foyer uh, at the welcome booth. And we would love to see you there. All right, you guys ready to get into God's Word? Okay, go ahead and turn in your Bibles or look up in your Bible app, Matthew chapter 26 and John chapter 12. Matthew chapter 26 and John chapter 12. We're going to be looking at both passages this morning. Uh, we won't be there for a while, but go ahead and just kind of find them and mark them, and uh, that way you'll be ready. Today we're going to be talking about the worth of Jesus. The worth of Jesus. So what has intrinsic worth? What has value? What is valuable? You've probably heard that, that old saying, uh, one man's treasure is another man's garbage, right? And one man's garbage is another man's treasure. And yet, truth should not be confused with opinion. There are people who think that human life is garbage. Does that make it so? Does humanity really determine what is valuable? Is worth subjective? Jesus said things like, what have you actually profited if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? Wouldn't it be better to lose the entire world in order to keep your soul? He said, don't store up treasure on earth, store up treasure in heaven. See, what God calls waste, we often call worth. And what God calls worth, we often call waste. 
We don't always see eye to eye with God on what is valuable. But we're not above God. Only his opinion counts. Only his opinion is true. And trying to define value on our own by ourselves is essentially trying to be God. You see, we don't actually bestow beauty and worth and value. We only discover what God has already determined to be beautiful and valuable and worthy. As we stand and worship God today on Easter Sunday, we recognize that Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to save us from sin, has a supreme worth and value that goes far beyond comprehension. You and I are valuable as well, but this morning, our goal is to see his value. Amen? No one talks incessantly about their gold ring while standing on a mountain of pure gold. No one stands on the edge of the Grand Canyon and contemplates their own greatness. As we stand on the edge of the cross and the empty tomb today, none of us should contemplate our own greatness or our own value, but his. So as we celebrate the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and worship him for who he is and what he has done, it is so appropriate that we ask this question, what is Jesus worth? What is Jesus worth? So let's consider three different responses to the worth of Jesus this morning. Number one, what was Jesus worth to the world? Two, what was Jesus worth to Judas? And three, what was Jesus worth to Mary? But first, would you bow your heads and let's go ahead and pray together. Oh, Father, thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day of victory. This is the day of freedom. This is the day of glory. We thank you, Father, for your presence here with us today. We thank you, Jesus, for being here with us today. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for anointing this room in your presence and in the glory of Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would open our eyes to see the glory and the worth of Jesus Christ this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Amen. Number one, what was Jesus worth to the world? John chapter 1, 10, Jesus was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So last week we celebrated Palm Sunday, which was the day that Jesus rode down Jerusalem streets through crowds on a young male donkey, declaring that he was their king. And people threw palm branches on the road and they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But by the end of the week, the crowds were shouting completely different phrases. They were shouting, crucify him and let his blood be upon our head and upon our children. He saved others. Let him save himself. How did that happen? Why did that happen? It's because he didn't conquer Rome with 10 plagues and a Red Sea miracle which is what they were looking for. Centuries earlier, Moses prophesied to the Israelites that God would raise up another prophet just like him. But they didn't understand that Jesus was a greater Moses who was gonna deliver them from greater tyrants like sin and hell and death. In John chapter six, after Jesus fed 5,000 families with food that appeared out of thin air, the Jews tried to force him to be their king. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this truly is the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So they're ready to make him king. But by the end of John chapter six, they're all grumbling and criticizing and leaving. So what happened? Well, he started saying things they didn't like. He started saying things they didn't understand, and they were hard-hearted. After he miraculously fed thousands of them, they asked him for another sign. In verse 30, they said, what sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you? This is right after they had just been fed. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven 
and gives life to the world. So then they said, sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. So what's Jesus talking about? He's talking about communion. He's talking about his body and his blood that were given to us so that we could be saved. And they don't understand, so they start grumbling, and then basically they're like, this teaching is weird. Who is this guy who wants to listen to this anymore? And then they all left. So what was Jesus worth to the world? Well, basically nothing, if it wasn't on their terms. As soon as Jesus didn't give them what they wanted, they abandoned him. They took off. He healed people of diseases and set people free from demons and did all kinds of miracles. But when he didn't set them free from Rome, he became a waste of time to them. He was only valuable if he gave them what they wanted. They wanted a savior within their own context and guidelines. They wanted a savior that was useful to them for their own purposes. And isn't that just like you and I? Aren't we the same way sometimes? But if we only worship Jesus because he'll give us the things that we want, then we're clearly not worshiping Jesus. We're just worshiping those things that we want. And Jesus is just who we're using to get those things. So for many people, Jesus is not the goal. And if he can't help them get their goal, then he loses all his value to them. But the worth of Jesus has nothing to do with what we can get out of him. His worth is based on the perfection of his being. He is valuable because he's a good and a holy God, the perfect friend who loves perfectly at all times. He's always loving, he's always joyful, he's always peaceful, he's never rude, he never fails, he's always kind, he never gives up, he is perfect. He's the source of all value and he created all things to be good and valuable. He's priceless. And that's what makes our sin so horrific. That's what makes the cross so horrific. Our sin is our failed appraisal of the worth of God. The cross is our faulty estimation of God's value. Isaiah 53 says that Jesus was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. So two, what was was Jesus worth to Judas? Well, the Bible tells us exactly what Jesus was worth to Judas in Matthew 26. He was worth 30 pieces of silver, right? Matthew 26, 14, then one of the 12, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they weighed out 30 pieces of silver for him. And from that time, he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. So Judas betrayed Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He kissed him on the cheek, and then Jesus was arrested, beaten, and crucified. And once Judas realized what he had done, he was overcome with regret. And he went out, he, went out, he tried to return the 30 pieces of silver, and he, then he went out and hung himself. He killed himself. So how did Judas get on this suicidal road? We just read that Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, but there's a story that happens right before this that reveals more about Judas's failure. So we can read that together now. Matthew chapter 26, starting with verse six. We'll read down to verse 13. While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. By pouring this perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done 
will also be told in memory of her. So we know from other places in scripture that the disciple who spearheaded this protest was Judas. Judas was Jesus' treasurer, and he was in the habit of stealing money from the donations that people gave to Jesus. And so when Jesus sees this entire alabaster jar poured out on Jesus' feet, he is furious. He's like, first of all, this is entirely unnecessary, right? Like, nobody needs to use this much perfume. Like, this isn't like junior high, right? Nobody should be wearing that much cologne. Secondly, this is like 300 denarii worth of wages. It's a year's worth of wages. I don't know how much you make in a year, but are you ready to waste every drop of money that you make this year on the feet of Jesus? Because he's looking at this and he's like, that's a lot of money. Some of which I could have stolen for myself. What a waste. What a waste. Now, as I was studying this passage, that phrase kept replaying in my mind over and over and over and over. What a waste. What a waste. What a waste. To Judas, this, this was completely wasteful because money was the real treasure to him. And because we sacrifice for the things that we value, Judas was willing to sacrifice Jesus for money, the thing that he valued. He wanted to sacrifice the worship of Jesus to receive the alabaster jar for himself, which led him to sacrificing the person of Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So do you see what happens when we miss the worth of Jesus? Do you see what happens if we miss the worth of Jesus, if we fail to treasure him as infinitely worthy and infinitely valuable? As soon as we start to see treasuring Jesus as a waste of time, we are headed down a road of destruction, just like Judas. When we miss the worth of, Ju of Jesus, we will always respond the way Judas did. What a waste. And we'll always see alabaster jars as things that are wasted on Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 37, the one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Many people hear those words and they think, I don't want to surrender my family. I don't want to surrender my, fi my finances. Like my tendency is to keep my stuff. It's to value my job, to control my assets, to control my decisions. I don't feel like I, like I can actually let go of my addictions. So why would I give up everything? Why would I give up my entire, lot, my entire life just to pick up a cross instead? What a waste. But the answer lies in the idea of waste and worth. Like we said earlier, God doesn't see waste the way that, see, he, that we see waste. He doesn't see worth the way that we see worth. Is it really wasteful to sell your house to save your child? Is it really wasteful to sell everything that you have, to give up every penny that you have for treasure in a field? Is it really wasteful to spend your entire life on Jesus Christ? If Jesus Christ truly has infinite worth, then of course it's not wasteful because he's worth it. Jesus is worth it. And when we see the worth of Christ, then no alabaster jar in our lives could ever possibly be wasted on Jesus. He's just worth too much for anything to ever be wasted on him. And this is what Mary of Bethany knew in John chapter 12. So number three, what was Jesus worth to Mary? I love this. I love this. I love this. We can read about the same story in John, which tells us that the woman with the alabaster jar was actually Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who Jesus had raised from the dead. So let's read about her side of things from John chapter 12, starting with verse 1, and we'll go all the way to verse 8. Six days before the Passover... So this is right before Jesus died. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. And so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them. Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? 
He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. So probably just a few months before, or even a few weeks before, Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And in doing so, he saved Mary and Martha from a lot of heartache. He saved them from financial ruin. And so now they are all overwhelmed with gratitude. Mary is overwhelmed with gratitude. So much so that she pours this very expensive alabaster jar all over Jesus' feet and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And for a Jewish woman, her hair was the symbol of her glory and her honor, her worth her value, her beauty. It's it's an act of extreme humility. It's a beautiful moment of extreme devotion and love. Only slaves washed feet like this. So this was the highest form of humility and love that she could possibly demonstrate. And yet because it was Jesus who had been their close family friend, who had raised Lazarus from the dead, who had taught them the very words of God, this was hardly enough There were no words beautiful enough. There was no actions humble enough. There was no perfume costly enough to show her love and affection for Jesus Christ. He had loved her. He had healed her, comforted her. Soon he was going to die for her. And while Judas looked on at this extravagant show and thought, how wasteful, Mary thought, how insufficient. How insignificant. Mary is pouring out her entire life upon Jesus Christ. And some would call this a waste. But this waste, this waste is what pleases Jesus. You see, proper stewardship of that expensive perfume was not to save it. It wasn't to sell it for a profit. It wasn't to sell it and give the proceeds to feed the poor. It was to waste every drop of it upon the feet of Jesus. And Jesus would not have been satisfied with getting the most use out of the alabaster jar or getting the most use out of Mary. You see, the Judases of the world look at Jesus and think, how can I use you? How can I maximize your usefulness to me? But Mary didn't look at Jesus to use him, and Jesus didn't look at Mary to use her. Usefulness is not what the gospel is about It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about sitting at his feet and pouring yourself out before him in love and in worship. That is the only thing that will properly glorify and satisfy and please God. He is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. He is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Give the Lord praise. Go ahead. Now, that doesn't mean that we do nothing. It doesn't mean that we sit around all day singing kumbaya and just loving Jesus and we do nothing. No, we still, we still serve. We still work for him. We still minister to him. But the goal, the goal of it, the point of it is not about what you can do for God. It's about what he's done for you. It's not about how you can perform for God. The goal is for you to be with him. It's for you to belong to him and to be with him. So what was Jesus worth to Mary? Everything. Everything. And that's because she looked at what Jesus had done for her and how glorious he was, and she saw him as the most valuable thing in her life. She could have poured that alabaster jar all over the feet of her brother. She could have used it at his funeral when he died just a few weeks or months before, but she didn't. Because that would have been a waste. Because she wanted to pour it out only on the feet of Jesus to honor him as worthy and holy because of the sacrifice that he was about to make for her and for the world. And so here we are this morning, each of us with our own alabaster jars, our very lives, and Jesus is worthy of nothing less. Most of us would acknowledge that Jesus has infinite worth. But are we acknowledging Jesus as having infinite worth? 
I, I know that Jesus is valuable, but do I treat him as valuable? So I think if you were going to ask Judas if he thought Jesus was valuable, I think he would have said yes. I think he would have said, yeah, Jesus is great. Love Jesus. He's valuable. But his actions didn't line up with his words. If I have a car or any possession, a house or a child or anything that I treasure, but then I don't take care of that thing, that item, that possession, that person, then it's not true. I can say that I value it no matter, you know, I can say that I value it, but no matter what I say, I'm not actually valuing it if my actions don't line up with my words. The key is to align ourselves with God and what he says is valuable and what he says is worthy. And God says that he has worth and value. God says that Jesus Christ has worth and valuable. That, and value, that he is worthy to receive all things because he created all things. And he redeemed all things with his body and his blood on the cross. Revelation 5, 11 through 12 says, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing to receive all things so what is Jesus worth to me what is he worth to us what is he worth to you what is the relationship with Jesus Christ worth to you and how do your actions line up with that forget about all your plans of what you can do and waste your life at the precious feet of Jesus because this is the truth. Jesus is priceless. And the only way to get something that's priceless is to give everything that you have for it. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? He viewed us as priceless, so he gave it all. And he is priceless to us, so we give everything to him. An old preacher from the 1800s, Charles Spurgeon said, is anything wasted, which is all for Jesus? It might rather seem as if all would be wasted, which was not given to him. In a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion. And we want this moment to be an alabaster jar for you, poured out at the feet of of Jesus for what he's done for you. Because you see, Jesus had an alabaster jar too. And he poured it out for Mary and for me and for you. But see, when he poured out his alabaster jar, it wasn't spilled out in perfume, it was spilled out in drops of blood. It was his precious blood. First Peter 1.18 says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it wasn't paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. The night before he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. He blessed and he broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat it. This is my body. And then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He literally poured himself out. All blood, all water. Jesus was determined to pour out his life for you and I. And when he shed every drop of his blood out on the cross. It may have seemed like an extravagant waste to some, but to Jesus, this was true worth. This was worth doing. This was valuable. This was his alabaster jar wasted in furious love on the crowds of humanity who would crucify him with their sins. You and I. Nothing less than wasting his life upon you and I would please the Son of God. And just as each step Jesus took toward the cross was a step filled with faith, he now invites you to take a step of faith toward him, to step into his work, 
to step into his grace, to step into his sacrifice, his lordship, his value, his worth. And we can do that through communion by partaking of his body and his blood through the symbol of the bread and the juice. You see, through communion, we are invited to step into the worth of Christ. We could never be worthy in and of ourselves. We could never discern, deserve him. We could never earn him. And yet he spilled his blood freely to make us worthy in his eyes, to make us holy in his eyes. Not by our good works and our sacrifice, but by his work and his sacrifice. Your heavenly father is inviting you to lay your life down, to pour it out, to waste your life in holy worship at the feet of Jesus and to step into true worth. I want us to remember that. I want you to remember that this morning with a simple, small action step. So in just a moment, uh, the worship team is going to lead us in worship. And I want you to take a step of faith into the worth of Christ by partaking in communion. Um, this is for anyone who has made Jesus Christ the Lord of their lives or who is ready and willing to make Jesus the Lord of their life right now. If you're ready to give your life to Christ right now, then you are invited to the table of the Lord to take communion and to remember him for what he did for you, to honor him for what he did for you, to surrender to him because of what he did for you. So let me just give uh, us a few instructions really quickly. As you feel led, as you feel led, you'll come down, you'll grab the communion elements, either at uh, any of these tables here at the front. Um, then you can go and you can kneel at the altar. Um, you can... Um, go and pray, take communion there. You can go back to your seat. You can take some time to reflect there and think about what he's done for you. Think about what he's saying to you. Um, if you need someone to bring the communion elements to you, then you can raise your hand and an usher will bring them to you. Um, please leave your seats to your left. And then when you come down for the communion elements, return to your right. I think that'll help everyone. Guys, this, so this piece of bread... And this cup of juice is his alabaster jar. This is the alabaster jar of Jesus Christ poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins and for the healing of your soul. Come and step into the worth of Jesus Christ. We'll take about 10 to 12 minutes for worship. As you feel led, come and do that. God bless you guys. Oh
everything new Everything bows at his name Everything bows at his name Sickness, darkness, chains Break at the name of Jesus Everything bows at his name Everything bows at his name Sickness, darkness, chains Break at the name of Jesus Everything bows at his name Everything bows at his name
beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name. You know, we humans, <laughs> we are so terrible about making things about us when it's not really about us. And so even just down there, I was during communion time and started thinking about things and having a pity party for myself and started making it about me and started thinking about some problems that I've got going on. And the Lord spoke to me and was just like, focus on me focus on me whatever you have going on in your life whatever problems you have in your life whatever struggles you have whatever sins whatever addictions whatever heartache and heartbreak this is everything this is everything this is what you need Jesus said in John 6, my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. In other words, this is real nourishment. This is what you need to live. We can't be saved on our own. We need help. We need Jesus. We all need salvation. We all need help and we all need Jesus. And this is the answer. His body and his blood, his victory represented in this tiny little package with his body and his blood represented in it. We all need Jesus Christ. Listen, the Lord is here to completely make you new. He will give you a new outlook on life. He'll give you a pathway to life and freedom and a home in heaven with him for eternity. But only he can do that. I can't do that. I can't change you. I can't transform you. You can't change you. You can't transform you. So turn to Jesus right now. I want to invite you to come to Jesus. If throughout this service, if throughout this time of communion, you felt like the Lord was drawing you and you haven't given your life to Christ, I want to give you that opportunity to do that. You need to do that. Do it today. And like I said, the Lord, you need help, the Lord can do it. And I will be here to help you with that, to walk you through that. We have a whole team of people over there, right there in the fellowship hall. In just a few moments, you can go over there, you can meet with us. If you wanna take some steps toward Christ, then go ahead and do that right now. Come and talk to us. If you're new, and you just wanna come and say hi, we love meeting um, our visitors and new people. We want to get to know you. For every person who comes and just goes over there and says hi to us, we make a donation to Project Rescue, which is an international organization that saves people from sex slavery and gives them a life and a future and a hope. So for all you have to do is just come and say hi. Um, we would love to get to know you and meet you. And that can be your part to impact and change the world. So I hope, hope to see you over there. And Pastor Eric's got some announcements for you too. You ready? That's it. Well, first of all, guys, it's, it's been wonderful to be here this morning, hasn't Amen. it? Amen. And it's great to see this house full and, and we plan and we organize and we've got all kinds of upcoming events for you in April. And, and the reason we do that is not because we want to keep ourselves busy. The reason that we want to do that is because we want to see you connected to this body. So I'm going to tell you a few things that you can get connected in. Next Saturday, how many men do we have in here? Men, let me hear you. Woo! Men, Come let on, me hear man. you, men. Yeah. Come on, men. Uh. So listen, we have a free men's breakfast at nine o'clock in the morning, right over here in the fellowship hall. Every single one of you are invited to come, attend, fellowship, yes. eat, have a good time There's together. Bacon. There's bacon. If bacon. you don't want free bacon, you're not a man. 
And then next Sorry. Sunday, we'll guys, we have our Foundations 101 class, as Pastor John mentioned earlier. We've already had about 100, a little over 100 people attend and go through this. This is for everybody in this room as well. So you are all invited to sign up online. Again, it'll be offered next Sunday during second service. And then April 9th is right around the corner that kicks off our men's, women's, and kids spring session. It's something else to think about, to mark your calendars, to get involved in. And then on the 13th, that's a Saturday, we have our annual current youth rummage sale. And for that, I'm asking that everybody just goes through, does a little spring cleaning, find something of some value, one or two items maybe, bring them in starting tomorrow so we can get the, uh, sell them. It'll benefit us going to camp and taking our youth there. Guys, I want to let you know, I know we've spoken to many people's hearts through the Lord today. Prayer teams are available right now. Um, in Oasis, there's a petting zoo for kids. So if any kids that are in here, if you guys want to go see some animals, they're over there in Oasis. Thank you for being here today, guys, on this powerful Sunday. God bless you and have a happy Resurrection Sunday. Woo! I don't ever want to go back Ain't no explanation How I saw the light But he found me and set me free And brought me back to life Blame it on the transformation Change down to the core His love is real Now can't sit still Cause my days not shame no more, no more Good God Almighty, he changed me Great God Almighty, he you gotta change, change, change Like you change, change, change Brand new looks so good on you So change like you've been changed Come on, change, change, change Change, change, change like you changed Came to you when everything seemed fine